It must have been scary for you because obviously, I mean, you, we, we sort of skipped over the, the, that thrust of your year. So on New Year's Eve, December 18, you find out that you have what could take away this incredible gift from you. <clears throat> you know, you could have lost your voice and you must have been fearful of that. Yeah, it was a very, very um, anxious time, really, um, to go for a checkup and then they find a polyp on your vocal cords and you're not sure what that is or how to get rid of that, etc., etc. And then having to have uh surgery to remove it and then the risk of that itself and then having to go through recovery learning to talk learning to sing and then learning to perform and then learning to record it's all quite a a very psychological thing it's quite difficult you know it's a bit like i guess a footballer having an injury or a ballet dancer breaking her ankle when you go back out there do you still have the same confidence and that's probably why i didn't tell anybody um the people in the band still don't know really on that film. I've never told them, so they're going to find out when they watch the film. Um, I think I needed to get it all under my belt to know that I could do it all again for myself. And then I trusted Ben's version of it, the director, and and he's done it in a very respectful way, actually. So um, if it's a story that can help other people going through a similar situation, then then it's a good thing because I was a little bit lost at times. It's very, very frustrating and very, very nerve-wracking and very, very fearful because it's the thing I've depended my whole, whole life upon really. Yeah and I think it shows a vulnerability about you really and it shows the honesty and the fact that you let a, a director and a, a film cameraman really tell the story and you see what they come up with. I was surprised when I read about the fact the band nobody only your very closest family were aware of this and I mean the stories I mean I heard about you you, you went back home to recuperate in South Wales but you yeah. you couldn't talk to anybody. No I couldn't go out um because I was, I was only allowed to, I, the first three days i wasn't allowed to speak at all <clears throat> and then the second day i could i could read aloud for two minutes and then the third day or the fourth day i could do like four minutes so it was like if i went for a walk and i bumped into somebody there's no way i'd be able to narrow that down to two minutes so i thought i might as well just stay in for the first week and then ease my way into it as he went along so yeah it was just my mom and dad popping over i didn't take the kids down with me or anything so i just kind of uh, stayed quiet. It's quite weird being in solitary and not being able to talk at the same time. It's a very uh, odd experience. Yeah, it? especially somebody that's got this great gift of communication that you've got, not just singing, but now we know telling stories. I mean, actually watching you go through the recovery process, and I mean, it's really fantastic. It was, it was almost a masterclass in how to do it, in that you show the audience how you learned to sing again and the frustration on your face when you, you couldn't hit these notes you'd been singing since you were 12. Yeah. It must have been really difficult. It was horrible. It really was, you know, because I was trying too hard at some stages, I guess. I was going into the room at like nine in the morning trying to do stuff that I wasn't going into the room at nine in the morning when I was 24 trying to do stuff. <laughs> I was going around it the wrong way, really. I was too eager, too um, too scared, probably, to, to think that I was never going to get it back. So after a while, I worked out my rhythm and I worked out, you know, maybe just get up, eat, maybe go for a run, you know, get yourself you know, alive first and then try to do some stuff. So bit by bit, I pieced it together and bit by bit, uh, I went back into some band rehearsals and, and kind of got my confidence back. And, uh, and then it was like that all through every stage really recording was a bit difficult at first and then it fell into place and then it was okay again and, and on it goes, you know, so. And I think I've been more than I've ever done, really. Well, I really liked it. I really enjoyed it. And I'll be honest, you know, sitting there, sometimes you think, oh, I'm going to watch an hour and a half documentary. Will it be just clips of stage performances? It was those bits behind <laughs> the scenes. That tour you embarked upon, uh, the sort of mini tour, you know, you'd not done venues that size probably for years. And you were going to Shandidno in North Wales and you went to yeah. Blackpool and reliving your childhood memories. I mean, it must have been a thoroughly brilliant thing to do. Yeah, it was. Blackpool was cool because I went back to like a hotel. I used to stay with my mum and dad when I was a kid. And I tell a story of a guy called Fred that used to look after me by the bar while my mum and dad would go out and watch shows, you know. And they came back one night and he'd, he'd been teaching me how to roll my own fags. Um, <laughs> but it was like, it was just, a, it was a very, very strange thing to explain to my kids because they were like, how can your parents just leave you there with some strange <laughs> in the bar? And I'm like, yeah, it was a different time. It was a very different time. It was a different decade completely and a time we'll never get back. Because um, as well as being a masterclass for anybody going through difficulties and you show them how the face of adversity, this gift that you've got might never come back. And I think that's a great inspiration for anybody. But also, if anybody wants to find out how you write a song, seeing you collaborate, uh, which was new for you, but seeing you put together the process of, of writing a song, it was just brilliant to watch. 
Yeah, Ben Ben really loved that clip. His brother was filming on the floor and he was he was really noisy in there and stuff. But he was like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to put all of this in there. And I'm like, do you think people are going to be interested in that? And he's like, mate, I, I, I followed your band when I was in college. And for somebody to get the access to watching you write a song is a, is a rarity. He said, you might not think it is because you do it every day, but you have to remember that other people have never seen this. So again, I trusted Ben on that and he, and he put it in there and, it's an interesting thing for people to, to people to witness that as a fly in the wall. So um, to me, it's a kind of normal thing. So uh, and working with other musicians as well and learning from them. And it was, it was a really cool experience to make that record with them. It's funny, isn't it? That from my take, obviously I don't see that every day. And I just thought that was the, one of the standout parts of that entire documentary. The documentary is out in a week or so. And I know people are going to look forward to seeing that. And I absolutely urge them to do so because it's, it's fantastic. But of course, out of that came this album and a selection of songs. Now this, the, the title track, uh, obviously is born out of, of the 2019 experience. Yeah. Yeah, Don't Let Devil Take Another Day has been, it, it was on the Kind album, and I've had the kind of song knocking about for a little bit, but it does mean, um, you know, don't let the kind of dark part of the day get in the way really. Um, and, I, and I think the reason, I got that line subconsciously. It was probably from that Chris Christopherson song that I actually covered and it helped me make it through the night where it says, let the devil take tomorrow for tonight, I need a friend. So subconsciously, I probably twisted that around and made my own version of what he was saying in that song. Um, Cause I always loved it when I was a kid, you know? Um, so it's a, it's a title about seizing the day, basically, you know, don't, don't let, uh, don't, don't let it kind of drift away from you and kind of, it's your choice if you want to own that day or the day owns you really. Well, I'm going to play uh, Help Me Make It Through the Night, your version in a minute, because again, if anybody wants a masterclass on vocal, what a great delivery. I mean, that must be a thoroughly brilliant song to sing for an audience and see their reaction. It's a beautiful song. It was nerve wracking to do because my dad used to sing it and I was trying to do him justice because my dad did the Gladys Knight and the Pips version. And um, weirdly, yesterday, actually, a guy called Mark Mackey in Scotland, who's our promoter, he also promotes Chris Christopherson and he sent wow. him the song. And uh, I had an email last night from Chris Christopherson and his wife saying how much they love the version of the song. So that was pretty amazing, actually. Wow, how fantastic. I mean, you're used, though, to getting these uh, superstars contact you. I mean, I, I, again, I heard the voicemail of Tom Jones checking up that you were OK. Well, Tom was the first person I called after I had the diagnosis because I thought if anybody's been through anything similar to this, it'll be, it'll be Tom. And I called him and he was very, very supportive. And um, so he would call me up and give me advice and and tell me, uh, you know, how to, how to get through it and relax and all that kind of stuff. He was very, very um, kind of fatherly, actually. He was really, really lovely. Yeah. Everybody listening to this here in South Wales is going to be thinking, thank goodness Tom is the Tom we hoped he would be, and I suppose you prove it. <laughs> no, he, he definitely is. He's a lovely man. I've known him for over 20 years now, and he's, he's never been anything other than, than a gentleman to me. You know? Well, we say that, uh, you know, I think in your case, definitely music was your first love. 12 years of age, you started, you discovered you had this voice. I mean, how did that happen? How did you realise, I think I can sing? <laughs> um, I was in bands from 12. I did my first gig at 12. I was singing in it. There was a couple of other boys singing in it as well. I think I was pushed to the front to be the singer because my old man was a singer. And they just assumed that I would be the singer as well. Um, I didn't really fall into it properly, I guess, until I was about 18, finding my voice that people recognise as my voice today. Um, and the lyric writing came around about the same time when I was about 18, 19, when I was in art school and I was writing screenplays and script ideas and some of that would turn into uh, songs, lyrics. Um, so it was always very um, uh, image based and very, very filmic, my, my filmmaking and, and uh, my songwriting in the first record, very kind of observational kind of stuff. So. Yeah, that's kind of where it started, really. And, and again, looking at your life and seeing how close you still are to your, your family, particularly your mum and dad. I mean, your mum's reaction when you, when you FaceTime her and tell you <laughs> went to number one, it's just that and Mabel Cable are my two favourite parts of the whole thing. Yeah, I know. I, I was telling her on the phone the other day because I had to watch in the BFI with my kids. And my kids were loving that bit because they see their grandmother swearing, you know. <laughs> And, uh, and I said, you had the biggest reaction in the cinema, I said, from that two words that you said. And she was probably embarrassed by that, but oh, it was a class it's sure. Great, but it just shows how close you all are, you know. And on that yeah. filming, you went, did you sit to watch it in the back with a mask on so nobody knew you were there? I had to sit on the back row with a mask with my two teenage kids, yeah. Um, I, I, the guy in front of me recognised me. And then I had to go up and do a Q&A on the stage uh, with the director after with Fern Cotton. But um, 
it was good because it was just the night before lockdown, so it was the opening of the festival, and then and inevitably it was also the closing of the festival. Um, so I'm glad it's got a new cinema release a bit later now. Well, Kelly, listen, I know you've got a lot to be doing, but I so appreciate you joining me this morning. It's so good to talk to you. It's great that we can meet, albeit virtually. Uh, I'm going to play that, that your version, which I think is going to become the definitive version in the future of Help Me Make It Through the Night. Uh, Kelly Jones, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.